All right, tonight's lecture is on persuasive speaking. And what I'd like to tell people is that it's, uh, persuasive speech is different than an informative speech because with persuasive speaking, I want you to tell us to take an action. I want you to change our thinking, persuade us, advocate. And with informative speaking, it's just a lesson where you don't really ask anybody to change their mind, change their behavior. Their, with an informative speech, it's just enhancing our knowledge. But with persuasive speaking, you're going to be informing your audience, but you're going to be taking it another step to actually teach us or to convince us to change something, buy something. In this class, the assignment involves for for the group project, it involves you selling something. So you can tailor your, you can customize your speech to have an action step at the end where you actually ask them to do something, your audience to do something. So I want to talk about some concepts that go all the way back to ancient Greece. Aristotle came up with theories of, it's actually rhetorical theory is what it is. Have any of you ever heard of ethos, pathos, and logos? Yeah. Yes. Yes, good, all right. So what is ethos? What is it? I know exactly what I'm going to do. You're close. I, I know it's from after God. I, I know it's a few. I know we have to do something. When you appeal that thing. You're close. So ethos, ethos is your credibility as a speaker. So we, we have credibility statements in our outlines. When you talk about your credibility, your expertness, but it's also your likability. Also, you can have common ground with your audience. You're one of them, they're one of you, so you have that common, you identify with your audience, so that can also be your ethos. It's whether we trust you, your credibility, whether you're trustworthy, whether you have charisma, that's all your ethos. So that's one ingredient for persuasive speaking, and the three ingredients are ethos, pathos, and logos, and they all need to be a part of your speech. So what is pathos? In pathos, that's the emotional appeal that we use when we're trying to sway an audience and try to change their mind, try to make them think the way that you want them to think. So it, you have to use emotions, and Somebody just tell me some emotions. Sad. Yell it out. Sad. Mad. Mad. Angry. Yeah. What else? Happy. Happy. Sympathy. Sympathetic. Sad. Sympathy. What do you think is the number one pathos argument, proof, they call them proofs, pathos proof, that people who are trying to persuade use? What's, what's the emotion? Angry, sad. Sad. No. No. Um, but I would say more so like thinking to like be more um, something. Happy. Is it like no. no, that's logos. We're gonna yeah, get to logos next. Logos. No, what is the number one emotion that is used to persuade people? Fear. Oh. Fear. Or, oh, fear. Fear. Think about the politicians that are trying to convince the voters to be afraid of something in order to support them. And it's not always about your safety or somebody breaking into your house. Sometimes fear can be you're afraid that you're not going to have money in your bank account or you're not going to be liked. Your fears can be a lot of insecurities. It can be the fear of the unknown. It can be a fear of losing your looks, the vanity. You know, you appeal to somebody's vanity that if you're selling skin products or you're selling beauty products, these commercials that we see, we see these before and after pictures, or we have testimony from doctors. When we watch commercials, we see people who are worried about something, right? So we, we get them afraid. We, we make them fear something. And sometimes with political arguments, we get them to fear people who are not like us, that are different. We get them to be afraid of somebody taking something away from us. Or it could even be a crime situation. So the number one fear is, the number one pathos is fear. So let's talk now about logos. What do you think some examples of logos would be? What's a logical argument? The use of logos. 
a logos proof. An example of a logos proof would be using statistics in your speech. All the research that you do in your speech, these are logical arguments that you're making. So uh, an example of logos, it's not only just using statistics and, and, and quantitative type of messages, but it's also, you can use an example, a narrative sometimes, that's a very logical narrative to include in on your speech that would make us see your point of view. So you can use a comparison maybe, you could use an analogy, you could use a metaphor. Sometimes it's a story that's actually your logos, but a lot of times it's just a statistic. And you need to have them in your speech in order to convince us to believe you that if you try to convince us something is wrong with our current state, our current society, this classroom, we all have these problems that maybe we didn't know about, you're gonna have to talk about all those statistics, examples, illustrations, narratives. They can be hypothetical examples. You could end up saying, what if this happened? And you, this could happen to a student who's walking across campus in the dark, all alone, and that would be a hypothetical because I didn't say a specific person. If I was to use Trayvon Martin as a specific example, most people are familiar with that, and that's a specific example if I were to keep telling you what happened to Trayvon Martin. And then if I were to somehow bridge that over to a, an example that I'm trying to use that's maybe a Broward College situation, these are all logos arguments. There's deductive arguments, inductive arguments, there's something called fallacies, and they talk about it in the chapter about fallacies. That's illogical type of reasoning. It's the opposite of logos. When you use a fallacy, it's a no-no. It's not supposed to be used. But sometimes people get convinced based on, on, on fallacies. And an example of a fallacy is the either-or or the and-or choice, where you're told that there's just two choices. And a lot of speakers, a lot of politicians, they'll say, well, what are you going to do? We're either going to raise taxes or we're not going to raise taxes. Well, there's other choices that we have, but sometimes they don't tell us. So that would be illogical reasoning. Sometimes we could reduce expenses instead of raising taxes. So that's another choice. We usually have more choices than just two. A uh, straw man type of a fallacy, where and that's, that's one example. Another example is the the, I call it to quote code, but I don't know what they call it in this book, but where you have a personal attack on somebody and you say, that person is a rich person that's never worked a day in their life. So we say that to discredit somebody, but it, it actually is illogical because they could know a lot about the subject, even though they're rich. We could say somebody's a liar and that would be a personal attack. So that's, that's a fallacy. A red herring is something that's used and that's a fallacy where a politician might be in the middle of a debate about one subject and topic, and they throw out something that is unrelated, that distracts us, and they call that a red herring. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of fallacies, there's a long list, and you can learn them, and I don't suggest that you use them in your speech, but I want you to know about them in case you evaluate another speech somewhere, or you're gonna go on to study communication, you should know about fallacies. All right, so all of these are needed in your speech, and Something I also want to mention is that it's not always what you say in your speech and the research that you do. Sometimes it's the photos that you show us. You can actually have photos that show your ethos. You can give us a speech where you show a slide of you doing the topic, using the product, you traveling to the place, you solving the problem, or somebody that you know that is an expert on the subject and you can show their picture up here, their photo, and then you can tell us that this person is an expert. Your ethos is enhanced by having a credible PowerPoint. Your ethos is enhanced by having a credible PowerPoint. The pathos, you can have a video of puppies and kittens being abused and you're giving a speech about how we should stop animal abuse and the music of Sarah McLaughlin's playing in the background, and we have sad doggies and tortured animals. That's also pathos arguments, but they're visual. Logos in your slides would be bar graphs, pie charts, 
some type of table comparison. Those are all logos that you can use in your PowerPoints. So there's these, these three theories are very important to persuasion. Now I want to tell you a little bit about Monroe's Motivated Sequence. I guess I'll start it right here. Monroe's Motivated Sequence was developed by Mr. Monroe, and he wanted to teach this sequence. It's a step-by-step -step process that follows our thinking. We're used to thinking this way, so now I'm going to show you how to do the outline for this type of a sequence. So just like your informative speech, you have an attention step. And they're called steps. So you begin with your attention step. It's just like informative public speaking where you can ask for a show of hands. This is all for, for giving a speech. The attention step, how many of you in here smoke? And then you raise your hand. So that's one way of getting our attention. Another way is saying a shocking statement. Another way is saying a shocking statistic, a joke, a long narrative that builds up our anticipation, our suspense. That would be another way of getting our attention. Also, you could say a joke, but not usually in a persuasive speech. So it's just like the informative speaking step in persuasion. After you say the attention step, there's usually a credibility statement. And that's your chance to really put in a lot of ethos. So when you're saying your introduction, either as a group or an individual, you'd want to tell us right away why we should listen to you. Why are you an expert? What type of research do you know about? Whatever you can say to enhance your credibility. You're also going to, and you're, this is all part of the introduction. So Monroe came up with, he calls it the attention step, but it's really the intro of your speech. So in addition to credibility, you're also going to have your, your preview. And also, your claim is going to be in here too, I should put that. I'll, I'll get to that though. Well, I might as well put it right here. All right, so a thesis is called a claim with persuasive speaking. I'll also cram it in here before the preview. All right, so you, you would want to say a strong statement in your introduction. And it's really the main argument that you're making. Don't tell your solution. Don't, don't tell how to fix the problem. But just say, somebody give me an example of a strong statement that's got to do with a social issue. A strong statement. A strong statement about a social issue. Donald. Or a policy. Uh, I would say, like, as far as how Donald Trump is um, taking the millions out of the FEMA to support the okay. immigrant, uh, immigration. And, and you don't support it? No. Okay. So, for example, we should oppose Trump's, what's the program called, or the, the um, policy? Or it was FEMA. Like, I, I, he, he took... He rating took, FEMA? Yeah, rating FEMA for like $3 million, no, $11 million towards the immigration stuff. Okay. All right, so that's it. All right, so that would be our, our claim for this, this Monroe's Motivated Sequence speech. So then the preview that comes after that is usually your strongest evidence to, to, uh, to just tease us, right? This is just all part of the intro. So you would say something in your preview, not like an informative speech, but an informative speech you tell everything that's going to follow, but not for a persuasive speech. The preview should be more... In this example, I'm trying to think of the ethos, pathos, and logos, I would probably I would probably use a good pathos example of of why you don't like it. Of let's just say uh, hurricane victims will suffer. If this happens, if this is allowed. Okay, so that's what your introduction is going to look like. Then you start on the next step in the sequence, Monroe's Motivated Sequence. Number two, 
And we're now on the body of the speech. This is just like your outline for informative speaking where we, we go into the body now. But we call it the need step. In the need step, that's where you go through our current problem, the problem with the way things are right now. So today's problem. I can make it plural. Today's problems. So, so here's where you talk about all the bad things that maybe we don't even know as an audience that we have these problems. Using the example about rating FEMA, you would just go through all of our needs as far as there's these tragedies, hurricanes, natural disasters. So it, it, would be, it would be in an outline form. So you'd have a sentence here, and then you'd have subpoints. So that's one main point. Then you'd have another one. And this is all under need, and that's a sentence. And then you have subpoints. All right, so that the need step is all about problems that we're facing that need to be addressed because you're trying to convince us of something, and this is a policy type of argument. So once you finish with the need step, let me erase this. We're still working on the body of the speech. And I mean, usually you do the body first, but I want to just show you the sequence of how this has to work. So we just went through the need step. The third step in the Monroe's motivated sequence is called satisfaction step. In the satisfaction step, that's your solution to all those problems that we just brought up in the need step. So the natural disasters that I was telling you about how we're experiencing those, your solution is to stop the, the takeaway of that money, right? So Congress must whatever you're going to say to stop it, must veto, or no, I guess the president vetoes, not Congress. Congress must vote no on the FEMA raid. And then, you, you, these are all the sub-points that would back up that main point. Then you need to have another another solution. These are your solutions. So satisfaction step means your solutions, your personal. You would do your research to find out what the solutions are. And this has to address the needs that you just went through. Now these are your solutions. And then maybe uh, there needs to be a reauth reauthorization to FEMA. And then you have to have some points. So you'd have to do some research to back this up. All right, so then, so that's all step number three. The fourth step in your outline. After, after you have need, satisfaction, you have visual, visualization. And that's the fourth stage, visualization. It's called the visualization step. These are all steps. This is where you, this is, this is a process of building. So you've told us our problem. You've told us the solutions that you want to have happen. Now you're going to tell us how wonderful our world at Broward College is going to be if your solution is enacted. So it's going to be all rainbows, puppies, and kittens, and unicorns if this happens. So you would actually describe it. So here you would say, 
and it would be sentences about Florida will be much safer, we will have more economic development, we will have FEMA working much more efficiently where it will be fast response time, less death. So you would just talk, you'd portray it as how wonderful it is. Or you could instead go the other way. If, if you all don't pay attention to me, wake up. If you would say, if you would say, if my solution is not enacted and put into place, we're going to have terrible things happen. We're going to have disasters that will leave millions of homeless Americans. We will have a federal government that is losing money because the economy, for every disaster that happens, we don't have any FEMA money. There's going to be no economic tourism in Florida. We're going to have, uh, our taxes are going to have to be raised because nobody, no businesses are making money anymore. So you would just really portray it as having a terrible life if people don't listen. So you can go either positive or negative in the visualization step. Don't confuse the visualization step, meaning you have to show slides of things. You still will have slides, but visualization in this case is getting your audience to visualize either a positive life or a negative life if we listen to your advice or we don't listen to your advice. The last step for Monroe's Motivated Sequence is called the action step. We're now in the conclusion, so this is actually the conclusion. What do, you, what do you think we have to do in this step? Conclude. What do we have to do next? Ask for an action. Ask your audience to do something. So your choices of what the audience can do for your group projects that you're working on, you're going to ask your audience to invest or buy. If, if your speech that was on that FEMA exam, oh, buy, I spoke buy. B-U-I. So invest or buy would be the action that you're asking your audience to do if it's a selling, a speech on selling something. But for a social speech on, on just giving a social policy, that was the FEMA example, you're going to ask your audience The audience should call President Trump. You would have a slide that has the White House telephone number. So that's that's going to be step one of the support the supporting points. <coughs> one of the main points under action step. You can also have them call the congressmen or women. Call Congress. So that's a full sentence. Call Congress. Give the phone numbers. You can also have a petition for the action step. You can ask your audience. I'm going to pass around this petition when my speech is done. It's in the back of the room. I'm going to ask you all to sign my petition. Or you can say, please call your congressperson, and you'll give the phone numbers. So these are choices that you have for the action step. For Monroe's Motivated Sequence, though, you definitely have to have an action step. And then I prefer a physical action. I don't want everyone just to, I want there to be peace and harmony at the end. Don't ask your audience oh, please support the environment, or something generic. I want you to have a real action that they have to do, a physical action. Okay, so now that I've gone through that, tell me what the first step is. What's the second step? The need step. The need step. The need step. I'm talking about the steps. Oh, okay. The need step. What's the third? Satisfaction step. Then you got the visualization step. You can do the visualization step. And the last one. Action. 
So your outline has to be based on this pattern. Now, this is key. Make sure you put this in your notes. All of you put this in your notes. You can't jump around between these steps. So when I'm following you as a speaker, it's very easy for us in our mind to jump around between the need and the satisfaction step because that's really how a lot of speeches are and a lot of your conversation is that way. So this is the problems, right? You're talking about the problems here and these are the solutions. It's, it's very natural to go problem, solution, and talk about both, mixing them up. And then you might be talking about your solutions and then you bring up new problems. That's wrong. You have, to, you have to keep these grouped together. So once you finish with all the problems that we have and what today's policy is causing the bad things, you don't go back to it and talk about it. That's just how Monroe's works. It, it makes us, all right, you know, if we were to just talk to ourselves as somebody's giving a Monroe speech, we'd be saying, wow, I didn't realize that that was happening in our government. Wow, I could really be in danger. All these things are working. Oh wow, FEMA, they fund all of these emergency operations and Red Cross is gonna, what am I gonna do if we, if we, we lose our roof off of our house? You know, I remember, I remember the Katrina disaster. Oh my goodness, FEMA didn't help them. The federal government let down the people in, in New Orleans. That's gonna happen here. So then all of a sudden, you're the bright one going into your satisfaction step about what you wanna do about the problem. And we're gonna to listen to you, and then you're gonna tell us how wonderful it's gonna be if we listen to your advice, and then we're gonna be ready to sign on the dotted line. That's just how the sequence works. Is there any way you can like put good job and visualize it satisfaction like have to visualize first day to see where you're coming from and then? No, but you will have slides that follow along with all this. And there's a teaser you can give in the attention step. You can do some teasers, but don't, don't, don't tell anybody about your petition until you get to the end. Okay. Don't tell them about, don't tell them about your solution in the introduction. So, so save some of this. The attention step is really just all about creating interest. We, we want to know, wow, you look really, you look worried when you're giving this speech, or, or, Wow, this product that you have, you've enticed me. What is this product you're teasing me with? And then you have to tell us about, what well, I can't remember what your products are in this class, but imagine that it's coffee and you are gonna be telling us all about how our current coffee market has coffee that has been processed and processed and over-processed and you've got me all worried about what I'm ingesting and maybe this, this grind that I'm having, maybe I'm paying too much for it. So I'm gonna have all these feelings during your need step, right? I'm gonna have these worries. But you're gonna tell me about your product that's a coffee that you can guarantee I'm not wasting money and I'm healthy, I'm drinking it, and it's gonna be healthy for me. So that's just examples. And you think about the commercials, they use this pattern. You can think of a Tide commercial where you know, parent and child and the child has a shirt that was just purchased and they're out playing with their friends and the shirt gets soiled and the, the parent sees the child's dirty shirt. What am I gonna do? I just bought this shirt. I'm gonna be humiliated when I take you to the party at the neighbor's house with this dirty shirt on. And you would just you know, talk about how, how terrible it is to wear soiled clothes, go to school looking that way. People think I don't take care of my children. And then the satisfaction is that you have this product that cleans the shirt, the spots are removed, but then you see the happy family at the end, smiling and back to their normal routine. It's the same with a car commercial. You have this whole image of driving on this beautiful highway with your luxurious vehicle. And all of a sudden, the, the two people are in love in the car and all of a sudden they're kissing, they're happy. What does that have to do with a car? They're, they're selling you that whole visualization. You're going to be more in love. You're not going to be lonely and desperate. They, the products, the beauty products, if we were to follow the sequence, you have the before, you have the after, you have the visualization of the product. It works, and you see it working. And 
All of these theories are in place too with those commercials for makeup. The ethos is that this was scientifically developed by doctors who study people and know what's healthy to put on their skin. We can trust whoever this celebrity is that's pushing this product. The pathos with a commercial for cosmetics would be what I was telling you about. You don't want to lose your looks, you're getting old, you want to make sure that you have healthy skin, you want to look vibrant, you don't want to look 10 times older, and they talk about that. And then the logos is that our product has been tested, maybe, maybe you don't like that Maybe you don't like animal tested products, so this has not been used on animals. That would be a lot of Logos argument that we, we have a laboratory that does not use animals. We are safe. We, our products are non-allergenic. Those are all Logos arguments. All right, so that's Monroe's motivated sequence that's not in our textbook, but I wanted to make sure that I fully explained it to you. I'm going to give you some handouts and go over them with you. And let me turn off the recording now.